Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back to this week's Learning Collective Sessions. Uh, I'm here with Kevin Thorne, our last but definitely not least presenter of the day. He is going to be sharing some uh, different approaches with you about how to incorporate comics and comic art into e-learning and instructional design, which sounds like a really, really cool and fun topic. So um, I am going to share a little bit about Kevin if you're not familiar with who he is in the industry. Kevin Thorne is an award-winning e-learning designer and developer, consultant, and owner of Nuggethead Studios, that's with a Z, a boutique custom design and development studio specializing in online learning experiences. So, And he often speaks um, at industry conferences uh, about design. And I think this is the biggest topic that you typically share, right? Like, because many people aren't really sure how to share right. this or incorporate this medium into mm -hmm. learning design, which yes. is very unique, actually. So, and thank you for being with us today. And we absolutely appreciate Oh, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, we appreciate you, you know, taking the time out of your day to do this. And so I am going to go ahead and bring up your presentation there. Okay. And then I will hop off and yield the floor to you. Is it my turn? It is your turn. And by the way, if anyone is catching this live or in video replay, please feel free to um, pop in your comments and questions at the bottom. We'll have a Q&A towards the end of the presentation. And then the video does remain on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So you'll still be able to connect with Kevin and um, add any comments or discussion or questions in the future as well. So here we go. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Anne. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your day to come hang out and watch and listen. And hopefully uh, in the next oh, hour-ish, we will talk about, or I'll explain or talk about some ideas about the approaches to implementing comics in learning. So to get things kicked off, we're going to kind of slow down a little bit and just what is a comic. So defining what a comic is, I think, is important because if you think about uh, if I were to ask you a question, what is a comic? There's a number of things that, that might come to your mind. Um, Scott McCloud, who wrote the book, Understanding Comics, has a pretty good definition of what that is. Um, it's worth defining, but it's a medium. And this is where, this is what really resonated with me, is that comics is a medium itself. And the best way to kind of separate the difference is think of using video as a medium to design something or develop something in, in learning, like a learning experience. Um, it might be a scenario. It might be an explainer video. It might be an animation. There's a number of different formats and styles, but you're using the video medium as the output. So if we, if we can kind of use that as a parallel, that's what the comics medium is. And then the output or the different formats that you can do are comic books, web comics, cartoon strips, all of those things all fit under the umbrella of a comic medium. So <clears throat> if we look at it a little bit farther, here's another one from Scott McCloud, kind of defining what it is. But let's think of that in the context of e-learning or the context of self-paced learning experiences. Juxtaposed pictorial and other images. In other words, juxtaposed text and images. In deliberate sequence. I mean, isn't that most of the time e-learning in some kind of a sequence intended to convey information? And then, of course, the visual aesthetic, you know, to the viewer. So let's take that definition and let's tweak it a little bit with our own sort of edits, if you will. So we just toss in a couple extra words and now we've defined what is comics in learning or comics in educational learning or instructional comics or a serious comic. And now we have sort of a new definition that we can kind of play with that's kind of piggybacked off of what Scott McCloud wrote back in 94. So, and a couple other things, and these are quotes that I've got to kind of support this definition. Jack Kirby, if some of you don't know, he's uh, Jack and um, um, Stan Lee, Marvel, all the characters, Stan was the artist. Um, and I love this quote. I've been writing all along, but I've been doing it in pictures. Kind of the same thing. Osama Tezuka, very well-known anime artist. 
I don't consider them pictures. In reality, I'm not drawing, I'm writing a story with unique symbols. And that in itself, we can dive into that quote right there and do all kinds of analysis on, on what that means. And then finally, Chris Ware, if you don't, I'm not sure if Chris Ware, he's a fantastic illustrator for McSweeney's. He's done some other stuff, cover of New Yorker. Uh, comics are not a genre, but a language. And again, this is important because it ties in with the visual literacy or the science of visual language or visual communication, where comics have become more of an accepted form of literature. So today's agenda, that's kind of the background, a little bit kind of give us our foundation of what we're talking about, what is a comic. And now that we have sort of that understanding of what it is, where it came from, not so much where it came from, well, what it is, and then how, how do we apply that or how do we, what's the approach to it? How do we approach it? So <clears throat> we're gonna look at educational comics, interactive comics, which is just another approach. The formats, which is sort of um, sub approaches to the different types of formats, and then stylistic things that we could look at, or um, think of a medium. Now, think of you know, let's go back to that parallel of video. Uh, we say, yeah, video is the output. We want to we want to put it on YouTube, but then how you go about putting it together, the shots, the formats, the styles, those are all part of different uh, uh, approaches that you can. Um, you can attack attack the project with, and then finally we'll we'll end it. I've got some research and some other resources um, that I can share with you. So comics for learning. The idea this goes all the way back to 1874. Now interesting about this one, if you want to take a look at Funny Folks, is actually the name of this particular first comic, or the first recognizable historic comic, if you will. But it was designed for adults because children couldn't afford to buy paper, right? They couldn't afford to buy the newspaper. So these were adult thing comics, and it's kind of the birthplace of editorial con comics, actually. So if you think of the, the daily editorials, it's kind of in that style. Um, but interesting is that it goes back that far, and then we, we fast forward oh, about mid-40s, uh, 20th century, mid-40s, around, around the wartime, and um, the properties of comics is like a language. And start, if you think of the, the, the golden age or the silver age of, of comics in language and all of the history about that, I'm not suggesting that we know all the details behind that, but it's it was sort of the birthplace of sort of this visual language where we started seeing more cartoon strips. We started seeing comic books. Um, we started seeing more and more editorial cartoons, political cartoons, things like that. And we started communicating more visually around that just pre-war, post-war era. So if you think of it as a visual vocabulary, and I've got some other information when we get down into the, the research side of it, um, we can think of it as grammar. So hold on to that for, for a few moments when we talk about visual vocabulary or visual language and the grammar. Now, Will Eisner, um, and if you don't know Will Eisner, um, Spirit is a graphic, is considered the godfather of the graph, graphic novel or the grandfather of the graphic novel when he did the Spirit. But more importantly, he did um, a magazine for the U.S. Army when he was enlisted. And even after he finished with the U.S. Army, he continued working on this magazine for 40 years, being the writer and the illustrator. And it was, it was called PS Monthly or Preventative Service Monthly. And it was just a small handbook, a small comic book that each month focused on one different target thing, um, how to service your radio, how to uh, change the brakes on your Jeep, how to um, Morse code, whatever it was at the time, every month had a different topic to learn, but it was all presented in sort of this comic format. And it would, it's still today printed. It's not printed in paper anymore. It's now digital, but it's still monthly. How many, six decades later, seven decades later. But this interesting quote here is that it's really interesting about how we should take it more seriously. And the teaching potential. You know, here's the magazine I was mentioning a minute ago. Um, the teaching potential. This was 1951. The teaching potential of comics. 70 years ago. <laughs> and it's taken us so long 
to really accept this medium as an educational format or as an instructional format. And I, I work in this all the time. I do projects like this all the time for instructional comics or educational comics. And um, I, I just have this personal experience that this is an up and coming, if not groundbreaking in our industry and in learning and development industry that we could use this format more often than we, than we are currently. Here's another quote from uh, Will Eisner. And, um, and I put the uh, parentheses down there because it indicates um, um, the research or a resource. So uh, if you look at the bottom two, and I, I failed to point this out at the beginning of the, of the presentation, but at the bottom right side of the slide, you'll see an asterisk. Um, that tells you the book, that the resource book that this came from. And in the parentheses is the page where it comes from. Um, but that's an interesting quote, if you will, also. It's the discipline application that creates the grammar. And we can spend an entire hour just talking about that. <laughs> so we kind of get um, to the point now that we know what comics for learning or educational comics are from where they came from. So let's take a look at some real world cases, some that are currently in use. And we'll talk about um, the difference between educational comics and instructional or informational comics. Um, this one is called um, Atlas Black. Uh, you can get this on Amazon. It's a graphic novel series created by Jeremy Short. He's a professor at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, he was trying to come up. He's an artist, comic fan, and also an artist. But he teaches uh, project management at the university. And he came up with an idea to create a graphic novel that teaches the process of project management, how to manage a, a, a larger project with these various characters. And then he has, this is required reading is with his students. And then his students take on roles of the characters within the comic. So it's kind of this blended transmedia sort of experience and it all anchored around a graphic novel. And he did the research as well um, to, along with this project to, um, define or to prove that graphic, graphic novels do improve memory. And there's loads of information, loads of research out there that we know that works. And we already know the research in learning and development where visuals properly design and properly used along with the instruction enhance the learning, enhance the cognitive load or reduces the cognitive load as long as we do it right um, and increases the memory. And the findings that he that he found on this research and there's the study there at the bottom and i've got the um the link to that study at the end of this presentation um but if we if we tie it back to the learning and development industry it's great for education right it's great to have a graphic novel or a little comic for a student to read to understand a concept but when we we get into the learning and development industry and we get into it's about business right in the end of the day what's the return on investment um, what are the performance outcomes uh, are we changing behavior so we have to be a little bit more um, careful when we're using the comic medium in this industry because we still have that business goal at the end and this research proved that it is a return on interest uh, return on that in training dollars or those investments um, moving forward, this was another one. This is another example. Um, this was a, um, uh, my goodness, the USS George Washington is a nuclear aircraft carrier. And it was replacing the Kitty Hawk in Japan. Um, and there was a political and a public sort of opinion, kind of upward concern about this giant nuclear ship parked at a dock near, you know, the, the, near the city. Um, and they were trying to figure out how can we get the word out that this, the USS George Washington is safer than the one that it's replacing, the older one. So what they did is they, they um, hired a um, well-known uh, manga or Japanese art artist to create a graphic novel. And they created a story by in this character, young Jack O'Hara, who is a young uh, petty officer on the ship. 
And then Jack would lead you. So think of an avatar or think of a narrator in your, in your e-learning courses. You can do the same thing in a printed comic book where this character would take you through and show you and give you a tour of the ship of all of its components. How does it work? Why it's safe and all this kind of thing. And then they, what they did is they had a target audience of who was the most, uh, the largest audience that was concerned. And it was targeted at young adults. And they printed, I can't remember, maybe 300,000 copies only, or maybe 30,000. I don't think it was 300,000. Um, and they distributed the copies ahead of time, ahead of the arrival, to, in order to get the word out. So think of it as almost like a marketing campaign, if you will, an educational marketing campaign. By the time the when the ship arrived, the aircraft carrier arrived, um, the whole the whole community came out to welcome it to its docks because they had impacted uh, perception. So there was this this unlying, unfactual belief of what the ship was going to do, and a graphic novel completely changed the entire community's perception. Um, that's pretty powerful. That's some powerful stuff right there. Um, and it's the U.S. Navy did it. And again, there's some information at the back. If you now you can't get the hard copy. I've tried to get the hard copy. Um, a copy of it, but it's it's no longer in print. Like I said, there was only a minimum run, but you can get a PDF version. You can download a PDF digital version of it if you'd like. Um, here's another approach to uh, educational comics, um, pathy, uh, pathophysiology. There's a series of books called Made Incredibly Visual, and it's geared towards um, the, the health sciences. And so biology, pathophysiology, radiology, um, uh, those sorts of science, medical sciences. And then they're all created, not so much in a graphic novel, but very much an illustrated, more illustrated uh, with the various characters and stuff to kind of explain to you and take you through. And you can see there on the screen, uh, just a, a, a two page layout of the cell basics. Now this is designed for college level. These books are college level books. Um, but if you look at that cell basics, that slide there, I just always remember middle, my middle school students at the time having to come home and make some 3D model of a cell. And I thought, well, how interesting would it have been to have something like this to help them understand the basics of a cell and maybe draw a, rather than create a 3D model. Here's another one. Um, this is uh, Bio Network. Um, this uh, comic actually won an eLearning Guild Demo Fest award, and I can't remember the year, um, maybe six, seven years ago. Um, but it was explaining pipetting. So um, it's a pipetting as a process within the within their um, within Bio Network, um, and then you choose an avatar and you go through it. And there's some scenarios, and it was almost gamification like where. Uh, you had scenarios and then you had to do the tasks. And if you did the task correctly, you moved on to the next level and that sort of thing. Um, and if you look at that one at the back, I'm not sure if that comic, I think it was running online at one point where you can go interact with it. So I'm not sure if it's still up and running, but it's been several years. Here's another one. Uh, remember our friend Scott McLeod? Well, he wrote Understanding Comics in 94. And then in 2008, Google... Uh, because of the Chrome browser, uh, asked him, if would you be interested in writing us uh, a graphic novel or, or creating a graphic novel to explain the inner workings of the Chrome browser? Um, the Chromebook, it's the Google Chromebook, it's called. Um, and if you look at the interesting thing about the artwork here, it's just sort of a blue tone, sort of a two-tone, duo-tone, if you will, kind of format. It has that same style of his understanding comics where there's a character kind of talking to you uh, first person and explaining to you as you go through things. Uh, very interesting layout. And again, I think you can get a copy of this. There's a digital version available for that. Um, uh, educational comics in the world of sustainable development or just social uh, justice or um, um, uh, global community, things like that. There's a website called um, Comics United Nations, Comics Uniting Nations. And what they do is they look for young artists and uh, storytellers to come together and they create uh, little comic books. And then it's all nonprofits. So all the books are digital free downloads. 
um, and they're all uh, around sustainable development. So it's educational, it's informable. Um, they're all digital. Um, I'm not, I haven't found any that are interactive yet, but I'm sure they're probably working in somewhere in that area. But uh, really good stuff. I've got a few of these books and they're great for children. So in children learning, I've got a couple of these for my granddaughters that we read together, especially the one I have here on screen, the 17 goals we can do to help the planet. Um, and then we get over here. Um, I'm not sure who the author of this particular graphic novel, this comic book, um, um, but when uh, the Apple Store, um, Apple's App Store, when they changed their guidelines for review, so when you were a developer and you uploaded your your app and it had to go through sort of this review cycle, uh, when they changed that up, it, apparently it was um, quite confusing and there was a lot of concern. There was, there was a lot of people not understanding the process. Um, so this was, if you look at this, is the Worldwide Developers Conference back in 2016. So what, four years ago maybe? Um, five years ago, four, depending. Uh, they created this comic book, this graphic novel to kind of explain how the new guidelines work. And it, it worked perfectly. Everything just sort of like, why didn't you do this the first time? And we could have had, we wouldn't have all these, um, you know, hassles of trying to understand how to do these new guidelines. So these are all success stories. Everything that I'm sharing with you are all real life working right now success stories. Um, here's an educational comic uh, I did um, a couple years ago with the U.S. Navy. Uh, this I couldn't show proprietary reasons. I couldn't show the final art, but uh, here's a screenshot of some of the storyboarding that went along with it. And the idea here was it's about event planning. It was a multiple episode series of interactive comics. And I put this under education. That's, that's that approach, right? So it's educational, but also interactive. But it's also instructional. So is it instructional and educational? So it, it really, it all fits under one big umbrella, unless it's specifically targeted. But in this case, it was teaching. Uh, the, the challenge was to have a consistent event planning program workflow process across all Navy installations to include to include um, on ships. So you have the large installations and then the smaller depot type installations. Um, so they, we, we came up with the idea to tell a story through existing relatable characters. So characters that the audience can relate to event planners. And then the event planning team in this comic, there were three characters would walk you through a fictional event, a large event, and all of the pieces and parts and logistics and everything that goes along in planning that event on, again, an environment of what they can relate to on a Navy installation. Um, and as of I know, that was a couple of years ago, and uh, as I've uh, heard, it's still is still running, and they're still they still got a lot of success out of that. Um, uh, now we get into the science a little bit over here, Benjamin Lee. Um, uh, comic cognition, exploring the potential cognitive impacts of science comics. So there's a huge uh, movement on the side of science, just like that pathophysiology um, a book. There's a lot of medical comics, a lot of science-related comics that are uh, really up and coming. So we can tap into that from a learning and development industry. I think we can tap into what are some of these other industries doing? So if Comics Uniting Nations are doing a lot of educational print-like comics uh, for sustainable development, then the learning and development industry, we can do it more in an educational instructional format. How do we do that? Here's the information, but then how do, what are the steps we need to do? How do we change behavior behind that? So we could, we could tap into these other industries on what they're doing successfully and then bring some of that, some of those ideas back into our industry and then start implementing at the industry level, at the workforce, workplace level. Um, interactive comics, so let's define that a little bit. I don't have, I don't have an empirical definition or dictionary version of the definition of interactive comic. Um, uh, it, it could be a number of things. And if we think of fundamentally you click on or tap on something on the screen, something else happens, some event happens based on your interaction. Um, let's not get too deep into what that means or interactive design, but let's just think interactive comics means that you're interacting with the comic. So that may be you're controlling the dialogue. 
you're controlling the pace of the action. Um, you can, um, if for instance, scenario, you can go in different directions. Um, so think of the build your own story um, from way back, from the way back machine. <laughs> you can build your own story interactively and then based on those choices other things can happen so we can do conditional logic um, gamification gaming anything like that that has a little bit more interactive engagement in the storytelling um, is defined under the umbrella of interactive comics so let me get a few more examples here for show you on this side um, this is an app that you can download on uh, your tablet device whether uh, I know it's a, a Apple Store app. I'm not sure about Google, but CIA Operation Ajax tells the story of World War, uh, early World War II, with um, um, the UK and India um, getting involved, the British and that. And if you look at that middle screen there, just kind of a screenshot of one of the one of the pages. But if you look at the center screen, uh, you'll see this is the interactive part. So these are actual top secret released documents from that period, photographs, actual documents. So you go to this sort of area of, of the comic and then you click on that little folder and it opens up and then you can see actual documentations that have been released, um, confidential, you know, they're no longer confidential and old original photographs. So you can kind of go deeper into the story and anytime you go along the story and it references something about that part of the story or that year, then you can go back to this sort of office area and kind of dig into the files and look at it a little bit more. So we can think of it um, uh, a really, really interactive or in immersive storytelling. Uh, Tell me your secrets. This is a BBC interactive comic. It's online. You can find this um, on the BBC web website. And it's true events that led up to World War II. But what I like about this is that um, it's a story tell. So it's just some interactive, a lot of motion, a lot of um, good sound effects. And it tells the story leading up to where the UK and the United States um, needed, the UK wanted the United States to join the effort. Um, but in order to do that, the UK had to take uh, one of their secrets over to the us to washington and try to in you know we'll give you one of our secrets if you join our effort kind of thing so part of the storytelling is you learn about all of these different you know radar things like radar technology of the day and then you choose two or three of those ideas that you want to take with you and then you fly over to washington and then you do that scenario and then it depends on whether they want to join you or not well if they don't then you chose the wrong secret so they have to go back and read some more and learn some more about it. But it really gives you sort of a sense of what was going on as it led up to uh, the early days of World War II. And you see the war theme here. Here's another one called Valiant Hearts. Uh, this is a game, actually like a puzzle game. Um, and it talks about World War I and a French family and a young soldier going through and then meeting different characters. But the artwork and the music and the sound effects in here, it's just, it's just like one of those, you just want to turn on the music because it's so soothing. Uh, but it's really, really well done artwork. Um, but it's also a puzzle. So you're going through the story and you're learning about the different campaigns in World War I. And then you have a puzzle, like a gate that you have to solve in order to get through to the next trail or the next campaign or whatever. Uh, uh, very, very interesting. It's, I guess it's, it falls more under the game genre than it does the interactive comic, but I like an interactive comic because it tells a story and I'm learning something about history. So it's a historical uh, education. Uh, Medicaids. Um, they, now let's jump back out of the adult arena here. Let's go back down to children. Uh, these are fantastic uh, little graphic novels, little interactive novels geared towards sort of the middle, um, you know, um, uh, middle school age, you know, five, six, seven, eighth grade, somewhere around that area. But it teaches all the different types of things like asthma or um, Crohn's disease or clinical trials or kidney disease, anything that a child might be going through medically. Um, that's what this is. And it's a set of little uh, superhero characters that go through and explain what it is, 
it's okay. You're going to be fine. Uh, we just, you just have this condition. There's millions of people that have the same thing you do. You're fine. Right. So you're be, and it just kind of lifts the confidence of the children reading the books that they're okay. Um, so if you know anybody in your life that has maybe some uh, interest in this, I would highly recommend uh, going to that website and checking out the Medicaid's or the Jumo Health. It's called Jumo Health is the website. Um, I'm just checking time real quick. We're good. Let's move on. Comic formats. All right. So we got all of these explained. So I thought about, should I do the formats and the styles before I talk about examples, but I wanted to show examples first. And it's kind of one of those things. Yeah, well, we don't have time to do that, or we don't have the budget to do that. Well, it's, it's not as intensive as you think, because if you think of video production and what it takes to put a good quality video together, scenarios, actors, time, set direction, set up, props, all of that thing. It's just about time. Um, but I can show you that you don't really, it's not about that. It's not about the artwork at all. First and foremost, let me get my dad voice in here. It's about the story, storytelling. Once you get the story, you're good. Now we take the story and then we look at it from an instructional design. How do we take a story and tweak it just enough to where it's educational, informative, instructional. That's where you spend your time. You get that figured out, honed, fine details, squeaky clean, then go look for an artist. And you don't need comic book art. You don't need superhero artists at that level. It, 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 you're just telling a story. If we look back at the Google Chromebook, it's just line art. That's all it is. Um, so let's take a look at that and I'll show you some really simple examples of how the different formats and stuff that you, you can do. <clears throat> now this is out of uh, Clark Mayer's book. Um, and just kind of talk about how comics and instructional design. So we just embedding the text leads to better understanding in an image than a text is an image is separate. So if you think about the separated. So if we look at these little simple line art caption boxes and speech bubbles, um, we, we get more out of it because we can relate to the character and we can see the emotion. We can see expressions on their face. We can get a sense of the environment based on the camera angle and how the room or how that environment was drawn or presented. Uh, so this is the power behind that visual language part of it. And then the formats, if we look at the layouts, um, I've seen a lot of these comic layout templates for e-learning and things like that. Um, and I, I would argue that it's probably not the best way to approach it by starting with a layout template. It's you start with the story and the story will determine whether you want a screen with several panels or whether you want a full screen. Uh, and it has a lot to do with going back, you know, studying Scott McCloud's work and understanding comics about timing and pacing and uh, the sense of um, uh, the sense of time and space. And you can do that with panels and, uh, sizing and things like that. But print is typically, you know, panel, like for a comic book. <clears throat> now, here's a bunch of different experiences and based on the format. So we talk about um, the different outputs or the approaches we can do. A digital static comic. What do I mean by that? Uh, digital static comic is um, uh, like a PDF like a downloaded PDF. So if we were to get that um, um, Navy comic for the USS George Washington, you download that PDF, it's not interactive. It's on a digital device, but it's not interactive. It's just a page swipe, right? It's just like reading the actual print comic. Then we have the motion comic or the motion video, which are very similar. The motion comic is more self-paced to where I can explore the navigation or I can control the dialogue or I can maybe click on a character and dive deeper into their backstory and learn a little bit more about the character. So if you think about reading a novel when you're reading about a character setup, the author might take you know two or three, four pages to talk about that character and their backstory and where they came from and why do they behave the way they do. Um, that's all written out in that story and that in that novel. Well, we don't have room, time, and space to do that in e-learning or in self-paced learning, but what if we gave them the opportunity, if we gave the learner the ability to explore that information if they wanted to, 
So that's the interactive part where you can like click on a character to learn more about that character. And that takes you to another sort of kind of like that um, CIA Ajax, Project Ajax, where you kind of go to go to this little side room and you kind of click on a dossier and open a folder and learn more. Um, and motion comics typically have animation. And when I say motion comic, I'm not talking about animation. It's more about um, subtle um, subtle motion paths or maybe subtle animation. Think of a little bit of animation that we do in e-learning, but tie together that fits with that story synced with music or and or you know dialogue. Um, explainer video, animation, gamification comic, educational comic, print comic. There's all these here that these are different approaches. And these are, um, we would make these decisions, obviously, just like we would do any other analysis. What's the learner output? What's their environment? What how are they going to access the content? You know, this we, we figure all this on the front end. And then based on that, we can make a decision on which type of comic format that we want to use for the output. Now, this is the part, I, every time I get to a break right here, this is the part when I when I do this talk um, in person, we, we ask questions at this point. So I know uh, Anne's having, handing on uh, the questions that are coming in. I don't see them at the moment. Um, but when we get to the end, I'll, I have some time here that we can uh, we can open up for some questions. So let's talk about style. This is probably just as important. So styles, there's so many different approaches to style. And when I think of style, you got to take that comic book, graphic novel thing out of your head. Um, comic style is um, like, like a writing style. So think of your writing style versus somebody else's. You can write about the same topic, but someone has a different style than you do. Same with artists, same with uh, artistic talent, if you will. Um, somebody draws a little bit differently, will draw characters expressing a little bit different than somebody else. But it doesn't have anything to do with the art so much as it's the style. And then we can find the artist. There are, there are thousands of artists ready to do this kind of work. Um, so it's more about this, again, broken record, but it's it's about the story first. What is the educational value and the instructional value of the story? And then we go figure out how we're going to put it all together. Maybe. I mean, it's not we don't wait. We kind of think about that a lot. You know what I mean. Uh, you know, we're thinking about those things along the way, but we already may have an artist in mind or, or something. This is black and white line art. Um, realism, if you look at the realism, it's um, essentially, if, if you see, it's real life objects that have been line art. So like a flip flown or a transistor radio. So everything is relatable in realism sort of style. Then we've got this sort of cartoon style. Um, and we call it flat because there's no, there's no gradient. Everything, all of the sh shadowing and shading that you might see in this style. So for instance, look at the trees, the pine trees in the back. See, there's different three, it looks like two or three different shades of green. Well, it's just, it's just playing with color and playing with tone. There's no real shadow there. Same with the fence boards on the fence behind the houses. It's just changing up little colors to give it that relief or give it that depth um, on shadowing and that sort of thing. And the cartoon style, you notice that everything's not right angle, a little, a little bend, a little bit here and there, curved or awkward shapes. And that gives it more of that cartoon style, that cartoon feel. Then we have this monotone line art. This goes back to the Google Chromebook, similar to what um, Scott McCloud did. It's just a one color, duotone, if you will, monotone or duotone. Um, a one color black and the, or blue and then black outline, but it's more metaphorical cartoon. So this is where you use um, visual metaphors to kind of tell the story rather than actual full scene art. But this is a style. This is a comic style. And then you can tell the story, you can narrate this. Um, you can turn this into a, an explainer animated video. Um, you could animate these in such a way where this character becomes the avatar and the character is the one narrating. So there, the, the artwork is, is one thing and then there's so many different approaches and varieties of how you can do it, how you can do the output it together, production. Um, here's another realism. This is more painted, sort of a hand-drawn, um, watercolor, crayon kind of stylistic. So think of the color style here. In the background, you can see 
um, sort of the door that she's opening there in the, the middle panel has sort of a crayon feel to it. And then if you look at her shirt, it kind of has more of a watercolor crayon kind of texture to it. So this is just another style, but it's, it's the style of art that resonates with the whole style of the mood of the tone of the story that we're telling at the same time as well. Then we get some more uh, hand-drawn um, realism cartoon. Now we're, we're, we're subduing the colors a little bit, opaquing them down a little bit so they're not bright. Um, and then it's just, it has a little bit of that realism, but still has a little bit of a cartoon feel to it as well. And, and so we can kind of mix those styles a little bit to kind of get a different look and feel. So as you can see with these examples, they're just, there's, there's, there's unlimited number of ways to approach it. It's understanding the different sort of mechanics of each one of those styles. And then how do you mix and match, pull them together, finding the right artist with the right style that you're looking for. Um, and then just like we would do that visual design phase in e-learning, it's the same process. The only, the only difference is a different output. We're just using a different medium. Same design phase processes, analysis, the instructional design, all of that's still right there. We're just choosing a different medium for the output. And again, it's about the story and style is subjective. Don't worry about the style. No rules. Okay, let's look at some research. Most of you are familiar with this, uh, the dual coding theory. Uh, nothing really surprising here, especially in our industry. We've seen this before. Um, but it's that middle piece there, that working memory. That's where, that's where the gold is. How do we get that information and integrate that into the active processing so we get it all the way back there in long-term memory? Um, and that's where, com uh, that's where the whole comics idea come in. When we can get the pictorial and the verbal together, either via dialogue or um, uh, narrated or something like that, but then the images itself. And if we can relate to the, if, if our characters and our story relate to our audience, where they're not just reading text on screen or they're not just sitting, listening to a two minute audio narration and we can get them engaging in the story with relatable characters in a visual scene that they can relate to I promise you, the research already been done, but I'm telling you, <laughs> it works. Now, here's an example. <clears throat> if you go back to that working memory, right? Um, let me back up one slide. If you can see here, we can only, and that working memory, it's it's argued that we can only process um, about six, seven, nine bits of information at a time. And what's a bit is is um, relative to what we're trying to take in. Um, but then if we get too much, we've got this representative, um, rep representational holding area that we're trying to hold on to. Uh, if stuff gets too full, we start, and that's the cognitive overload, right? That's when we start losing it and we, we can't process anymore. So if this example, I tell you, what, what is this word? Um, everybody, uh, I think, in the Western Hemisphere, you can look at this word and says, I don't see a word. I've never learned that word before. I'm immediately looking at that active processing and digging into prior knowledge. It's like, there's nothing back here. There's absolutely nothing in my historical references that I can pull from that I can recognize that word. However, I do recognize each symbol or each letter that is presented here. So we have WFDEXK, that's six bits of information. Now, how do I get those six bits of information that I already know process into a single image and then sa save that single image into the back of my brain. That's the process. That's what we're trying to do. So if we take that to something a little bit more um, that we can represent or we can, we can remember, or we know we look at this, we don't have to think about the six symbols here. We already know what those are because we've already associated those six symbols in this arrangement, the grammar or the spelling not the grammar yet, the spelling of this word, it's already been, it's learned. We've already learned it. It's already in our long-term memory. We don't have to think about it. Now this word becomes one bit of information instead of six bits of information. And then now I, I can put more on top of this and I can keep adding to this until I get to the point where, oh, let's slow down. We're, we're presenting something new that our learners may not know yet. So we need to slow it down a little bit. 
So how do we get this into that long-term memory? Well, that's where the pictures come in. That's where the visuals come in. So now if I showed you this, most of us would look at this and say, oh, that's a schoolhouse. Even though schoolhouses really don't look like that. Like, like with a little bell, you know, you know this, this is kind of an old school vintage looking icon, if you will, or a metaphor of what a schoolhouse is. But it's still, I, I would venture to guess that most people would go and say, hey, that's a schoolhouse. The more important thing is this image might even spark another memory about the school that you attended. Or, hey, there's a school in my neighborhood that looks just like that. Or I remember a school building like that. My grandmother or my mother or even I went to a school that looked like that. Now we're relating. We're bringing the emotion back into the story because now they can see and they can relate. And we don't have to write anything. We don't have to tell them anything. We don't have to say anything about it. We just visualize and bring that experience to them and let them bring it into themselves based on what they already know. Shazam. We got them hooked. If that's a polite word to say, <laughs> we've got our learner's attention. Is that is that's a better way of saying it? And then now we can get to business. So now if we take it, now we add a little story to that image. In a quiet Midwestern town, a small schoolhouse sits alone on a lonely dirt road. It is where Joanna discovered something that would change the course of her life. I got to go to the next screen. I got to know what happened to Joanna. What happened? That's storytelling, right? You kick it off, give it an image. And this is just a simple juxtaposed image and a little story to kick things off. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. It doesn't get any more harder than that. Everything else is pretty stuff and style. If this is something that uh, you want to stay late up at night, uh, bedtime reading, I would encourage you to go check out Neil Cohn's work uh, at the Visual Language Lab. Um, he does an enormous amount of research on the idea of visual literacy, um, visual language, visual communication, and he's a big comics fan as well. And if you um, go out there and sign up for it, he invites you to be part of his research. He does different research projects all the time. And he'll send you an email and you log in and they, you actually participate in his research. Um, so it's very, um, a wealth of information. There. He's got a lot of research on his website. Now we go back to style. Uh, most of you are familiar with the xkcd.com uh, website, science. Con so it goes back to science comics or meta comics. Um, data comics is another term. Um, what's really great about this is it's stick figures. It's just a little bit of writing and stick figures, and there's not any much more that goes on to that. Uh, almost like sketch noting, if you will, but if it's some of it is, uh, if you've seen a lot of these comics, you've seen that the characters are just stick figures, and it makes it so, it's about the story, right? Think about, it's not about the art because the art is just a stick figure. It's about how it's written. It's the story. It's the jokes. Uh, PhD Comics is another uh, similar style to Data Comics, um, but it takes sort of the sort of the data analysis scientific approach to different things. This is kind of a really funny one: how vacation is explained um, in sort of a graph, um, and you can look at it there. PhDComics.com, and then of course, excuse me, they have a. Uh, Instagram account where they show a lot of these pictures. Um, there's no serious consideration of the art of the comics can overlook the narrative function of pictures. Narrative pictures, sequential storytelling, visual literacy, visual language. It all ties together. All right, we got what about 10 minutes in, I think. So we're going to jump into resources. Um, let me just show you this real quick. We'll kind of walk through these. I can tell you where they are, what they're for. There's a lot in here that I didn't just talk about. Um, so um, a lot of the research references that I indicated, if, I, if you remember the asterisk on the slide that has some kind of asterisk, or there's something on the slide with a parentheses, a name and a, and a year, uh, you come to this slide and you can find that reference. Uh, in terms of um, the quote or the information where I got the from the, the research behind it. Um, and here's some more. Uh, there's Jeremy Shorts. Um, that's a TEDx talk. That's the one about the YouTube, or excuse me, the, YouTube, the uh, University of Oklahoma 
um, project management, graphic novel, uh, the incredible easy series, path, pathophysiology. Uh, that's just an Amazon link, but they have an entire series. So if there's any other book there, uh, there's a link where you can get the app review comic book, um, Scott McClouds. Um, and then there's the sustainable development. Um, there's Will Eisner's, a, um, uh, his online library. Now you can go back and look at all the archives, of the PS magazine. Uh, there's the Bionet, the pipetting example I was sharing. I'm not sure if that link, it should be. That's still, yeah, it looks like it's still a good link. Uh, there's where you can download, I believe you can download the Navy comic, uh, Data Comics, Tell Me Your Secrets, and the Operation Ajax. Those are those interactive ones. I know those still work because I still play with Operation Ajax. Valiant Hearts, there's the other one. That's an app. It's a game. And then we got some books, um, Jessica Label and Matt Maiden. I love that book. It's actually a, it's actually a, uh, college course in a book, if you will, or educational, um, drawing words and writing pictures. You can set it up in three different ways. You can do it to where you can plan and schedule it as a team where a bunch of people get together. You can do it virtually, or you can do it as a solo. Uh, and then you work through all the assignments and all the lessons in the book. Uh, Nick Susanis, Nick Susanis, um, is his book is unflattening and unflattening is, um, his graphic novel that is also his dissertation at Columbia University. So he presented a graphic novel on visual language as part of his dissertation for his doc, PhD at Columbia. Graphic novel is a dissertation. I mean, come on. If, if, a, if a university like Columbia can accept a graphic novel as a dissertation, surely we can present comics and learning. Uh, here's some other tools, different uh, tools that you can use. And then uh, from an e-learning perspective, obviously everything's digital. It's got to be developed, got to be authored in some ways. So here's a various number of tools that you can use. Um, and then there's several demos that I've put together, some of the comics that I've made over the years. So if there's anything in there that um, um, you find interesting or whatever, you can certainly take a look at those. And... That's it. We're good. Great. Thank you, Kevin. I think we did have a question from Tanaya here. Okay. Hi, she, Tanaya. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for joining us. So she uses Word PowerPoint for storyboarding. Do you recommend any other tools that a better fit for this format? Um, so help me out with that. Again, the question is, is Word she PowerPoint for storyboarding, do you recommend any other tool? is better fit for this format. Yes. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do I say that? Because PowerPoint and Word are two extremely powerful tools for editing. And for, I use, uh, predominantly I use Word for storyboarding. Um, and I've already not shared my screen, but if we have a moment, I can I, sh I can show you a storyboard I'm working on right now. Absolutely, it's a, I'll pull your screen back up. All right, hang on. Let me let me uh, let me pull it up here real quick. If I can find, gotta find the application. I had it up when we first started in. When uh, oh yes, yes. I had it running at the moment. Let's see. Here it is. Hang on. Almost there. And then, well, Kevin is looking. Um, to pull that resource up, Tanaya. Earlier today, we also had uh, Sarah Mercier with the Learning Ninjas on talking about storyboarding. So uh, you may want to catch that session and see if there are additional resources that that speak to you. Um, and I can certainly include. Yeah, I teach. Um, I also teach storyboarding. Did I share my screen or I stopped? Wait, oh, wait. you stopped it. There we go. Um, there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, I teach storyboarding a lot. And a lot of folks who use storyboarding, um, I've used all the tools. I've used the online cloud-based tools. I've used all kinds. Of, I've used built-in integrated storyboarding tools that are built with authoring platforms. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's a level of restriction with all those tools. Um, you're, you're unrestricted with basic Microsoft PowerPoint or Word. One, because... Uh, most everybody has access to those applications. 
Um, you're not having to worry with security purposes if you have a cloud base where somebody else might have to sign in if you have IT security and other firewalls. Um, and it's collaborative, so you can upload these to a collaborative place like uh, Google Drive or to where you can work on it as a team. And it's it's much more sim simple to use these. And it's just a simple, simple template. So you see what we do is we just draw a little thumbnail of what that scene might look like. Um, and then as we go through, we got different scripts. So this is real preliminary sort of script writing and some thumbnails, what the scenes are going to look like. And these are just single static scenes, but this is all going to be interactive and it's all going to be motion and animation. And then we've got some, you know, cue points over here to kind of tell us what to do. This is like early, early storyboarding, early, early script, not script writing. Um, and then as we get it put together, um, then it all comes together and then we'll clean up the artwork and then we'll clean up the script. We'll put the artwork back in this storyboard, final art. Um, and then we start prototyping some of the more complex animation se sequences and get those ironed out. And then uh, lastly, we put the whole thing together. So it's, um, I don't, um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's style, right? Your development authoring style is different than mine. I found Word and PowerPoint to be perfectly fine for the type of client. And I'm working with clients from nonprofits to governments to international. Um, in this case, there's a team in India that we're, we're working with. So I've got to be able to share a document that they can access, um, you know, things like that. So it, it, a lot of it has to do with how your team workflow, your environment, organization, all that. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody's workflow and teams are different in their needs. And I think he says that um, that's exactly how she does. Uh, but instead of a sketch, she'll say, put a placeholder text illustration of an image. Yeah, yeah. So, no, we, no, that's, this is probably, yeah, no, you're yeah. exactly right, Tanaya, because we did that same thing we did here before we did the sketches. Same thing you're talking about. We just put up quick, what is it, what do you, what's the quick visual that we can see that fits with this area of the script? And we'll just type something here. We need a, we need a, a camera angle of this view. We need this over that view. Uh, once we get that, then we take it and we hit the drawing board and we sketch them all out. Then we replace that text with the sketches and then we refine it and we just keep refining the storyboard like that until we start going into production art. Yeah, but you're doing it exactly the same way I do it. So, and then Duncan made a comment that uh, the same format works well for instructional video and online yep. training development yep. as well, the workflow. So uh, that was really interesting. So I had a quick question about the MediKids. Is that a project that you had worked on previously? I have not. Do you know anybody over there? Because I would so love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I did, I would, I would make the connection for you. No, it just it uh, resonated with me because we, um, uh, I volunteer for the Arthritis Foundation and there's kids who have a chronic disease. And yeah. That would be a great. Yeah, I found it. Um, my stepdaughter um, it suffered with um, chronic kidney um, oh, inf okay. uh, um, nephro. Nef what is? I can't even say the word. It's um, enlarged, swollen kidney. Mm -hmm. um, she suffered it for years and years and years. She just had it removed last August. So all through that period, you know, and she was a young girl going through middle school high. She lived with this whole problem through her whole um, teen years or whatever. And I found that site uh, and I found that book about chronic kidney disease. And then as I, now I volunteer at the children's hospital with the dial kids on dialysis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we sit with them once, well, not right now because of COVID obviously, but uh, we sit with them and uh, sit by their, you know, while they're on the dialysis, we sit there and draw pictures and draw cartoons and stuff with them. And I bring a copy of that book with them and it just, they, they don't feel alone. Right, they're not. They know that other people are dealing with the same issue. It just kind of puts a little light on it a little bit. No, I agree. It's a great resource, and it it doesn't make yeah. them feel alone, but also in a in a format that could resonate with them. Yeah. Right? It's not like sitting there just reading a, a medical journal or some yeah. kind of text like that. So, yeah. Kevin, thank you again. This was a thank you presentation, and thank you so much for your time. And if you're watching the replay, please feel free to drop in comments and questions. Uh, we will make sure that we've included the links to connect with Kevin so you can, you know, chat with him further about anything you've learned here today. And as a reminder, the video remains here on our Facebook page and will also be available on our YouTube channel uh, within the next couple of days. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thank, you, Thank you. And Duncan and everybody at risk. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely.